Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian, and I'm broadcasting to you from Central Europe, Budapest, beautiful city on the Danube River. Hi, Kyber, right on time. All right, students, today we are looking at some IELTS listening, section three and section four, the two more challenging parts of the listening section. This is a continuation uh, from uh, the class last week. Uh, so if you missed that one, it's okay. You can see section one and two of the listening uh, in the video from last week. Just look for the live class listening before this one. Hi, Onisim. Hi, Nguyen Tin Kim Nun. Hope everybody's doing great. Oh, and by the way, uh, happy Valentine's Day to everybody. A big uh, heart from GL's help.com. Uh, where our materials come from. So check us out there for general IELTS, G IELTS help com. And believe it or not, it's also my mother's birthday. She's born on Valentine's Day. So happy birthday, mom. All right. If you're looking for academic IELTS, go to aehelp.com and check us out there. Ah, Kiran, also observing Valentine's Day. Good for you. Uh, all right, students. So uh, if you want to get hard copies of our six original IELTS practice exams, you can do that. We sell it for a great value on Amazon for general IELTS. Search for GE Helps General IELTS. Uh, or you can search Amazon for AE Helps Academic IELTS if that's what you are into. Hi, Marwadi. All right. Uh, if you have questions, send me an email, adrian at g-i-e-l-t-s-h-e-l-p.com. That's adrian at g-i-e-l-t-s-help.com. And uh, you can also watch us uh, on our YouTube channel, Academic English Help Channel, which is our academic IELTS focus. Today, again, we're doing listening. Tomorrow, some uh, general reading passages with some strategies, some questions. And then on Saturday, we will look at a task two essay example for the persuasive. Hi, Pachu. Hi, everybody. All right. So uh, let's start off uh, nice and quick with some listening for General IELTS. Now, this is section three. It's more difficult than section one and two, so don't panic, okay? Just do your best. Uh, have your pencil and your paper ready, all right? Um, please do not write your answers into the chat. Give everybody a chance. Uh, I'm using a speaker and my uh, microphone to play you the audio. So if it's quiet on your side, please just turn up the volume. Use a headset if you have one. It's a good idea. And uh, for the audio, we will go to the website. Our website is a fully interactive website. You can do everything on the website, uh, play videos, play audio, interact, of course, with interactive questions, do uh, simulated exams. So you click that big red button, you join, you get a My Student account, you log in there. And uh, today we're looking at this listening here, section three. Uh, this is CD4, track number three, for those of you who have access to our software, okay? Um, so have a look here at the questions. Uh, we'll do a little bit of extra help here just to really make sure you get some good marks. Uh, so match the professor with their university, Dr. Henry Gergen, Dr. Gloria Mesto, Okay, University of Edinburgh Trinity College. So you're listening for those names in that question, obviously. Then here you have three questions, 22, 23, 24. Which three of the following are arguments given against zoos? So why zoos are not good, okay? Zoos, as hopefully everybody knows, are where animals are kept for human entertainment and display. Uh, looking at giraffes, lions, zebras, hippopotami, 
and so on. Okay, so here, what are the arguments given against zoos? The animals are treated inhumanely. In meaning not, humane meaning in a human way. So understand it means the animals are treated badly. Inhumanely means badly. Animals are persons, the conservation of species. Animals should not be in prison. Animals are human beings and should be treated equally. Okay? If there are arguments against zoos, it's probably not a good one. They are fundamentally wrong. All right? So let's keep going a little bit. Let's review these questions. Like I say, it's a section three, a little bit more difficult. All right. Uh, no more than two words. It's a short answer. In order to improve the conditions for zoo animals, zoos must be held to something of animal treatment. While zoos do conserve animal life, Dr. Gergen argues that this function could also be performed by animal something. Kyber, I'm happy that your listening improved a lot. That's great. Okay. Uh, by the way, students, if you have questions while I'm doing this, just fire them off. Uh, I'm a good multitasker, so I can show you the questions uh, in the listening and answer your questions as well. Okay. Uh, Subash, you get confused with multiple choice in the listening or in reading. Which one? All right, let's keep going. Enjoyment and are two key positive attributes of zoos. For number 27, if you had to guess this blank, what would you guess without listening, students? So just let's, I want to make sure you're all concentrating here and I'm not just jumping around <laughs> saying information. So uh, what would you guess for number 27 without listening? So education and, or sorry, and <laughs> enjoyment and are two key positive attributes of zoos. So it's a noun, it's another noun. What would you guess? Hi, Rack, huh? Yeah, but you, it's a noun, but you can probably even guess that noun. So we go to zoos, just visualize it. Children are at zoos. Enjoyment is entertainment, Usman. So it wouldn't be the same word. Okay, Sevgi, Rabia, very good. Informative, so enjoyment and information. What's another way, Sevgi, to say information? What's another way to say information? What do you think might be a more common way to express that for the person who's making this exam? Hi, Marina. Happy Valentine's Day. I guess in Russia... You celebrate Valentine's Day as well? So information is a very good guess, Sevgi, but what's another way to say information? You might think knowledge, but even more than knowledge. That's right, Pachu. Very good for you. Pachu says education. So enjoyment and education are two key positive attributes of zoos. Here's an interesting tip, students. Uh, you can guess about 30, 40% of the answers in IELTS listening and reading without listening and reading. Now, don't try that in the real exam, but it is possible just using logic. Absolutely. Enjoyment and education are two key positive attributes of zoos. If you think about zoos, you think about people going to a zoo. At every exhibit, there's usually an information board. The information board tells you the name of the animal, where they live, how many of them are there, the populations, uh, their habits, their habitats, so how, what they do, um, and you learn, right? So education, good for you, Pachu. All right, so keep in mind, students, logic is a very, very good friend in IELTS uh, reading and listening. Okay, uh, 28 to 30, choose correct letters A, B, or C, kind of a multiple choice here. According to Dr. Gergen, does the value of inspiring young people outweigh the negative aspects of zoos? Yes. No, he is unsure. All right. So listen to the way he talks, what he says. You should figure that out. Now, here's some nice multiple choice for the student who was asking. What is the interesting question? Whether zoos are ethical? whether the inspiration value of zoos outweigh their negative aspects, 
whether enjoyment and inspiration negate the importance of zoos. Okay, multiple choice students in the listening section, you have to actually catch the answer to easily give the right answer. You can't just hope to uh, select or reveal from the choices the correct answer. Okay, so just like in the reading for multiple choice, you need to understand the answer to choose the correct answer, especially because these are paraphrased. So it's a very little chance that you will hear the same words as the choices. So you have to understand this interesting question in order to select the correct answer. Again, you cannot hope that the answer will jump out from the choices. It doesn't work that way. Okay, that's too easy, especially for section three and four. Hi, Eugen. All right, number 30, what do the guests agree on? Zoo conditions need to be improved. Zoos are unethical. The inspiration value of zoos is unethical. That's kind of a strange one. So you can kind of figure out which ones probably are not answers. C here, as long as you understand it, is kind of weird. Okay, students. So again, those are the questions. Uh, we had a good review session here. You do not have that level of review in the official IELTS, but when you're practicing IELTS at home, you should do in-depth review sessions of the questions, especially for sections three and four before you listen, okay? It's important practice. So students, let's go back here to uh, the website. We're going to do the listening. Again, please write down your answers on a piece of paper. Don't put them in the chat because you can confuse other students, especially if you give wrong answers. So give everybody a fair chance. Uh, if it's quiet, again, turn up the volume, use a headset. Here we go with listening section three from test number four. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening section three. You will hear a panel discussion on the ethics of zoos. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Welcome everyone to this very special evening. Tonight's speakers are two distinguished scholars. Dr. Henry Gergen from the University of Edinburgh is a philosopher and animal rights advocate. Dr. Gloria Mesto from Trinity College, Dublin, is an animal conservationist. Welcome to you both. The topic of tonight's discussion is the ethics of zoos. Here is the fundamental question. Is it right to house animals in zoos or should they live freely in nature instead? As an animal rights advocate and theorist, I have clear views on this question. To me, it is fundamentally wrong to lock up animals for human enjoyment. I believe that in many important respects, animals are persons and should be afforded many of the rights that human beings have. Chief among these is the right to liberty and the freedom to achieve one's desired ends in life. Clearly, these rights are abrogated by imprisonment within the zoo. Moreover, in many cases, animals in zoos are treated inhumanely and are subject to confinement in extremely small spaces. While regulation of zoos may help mitigate some of these problems, I maintain that zoos are fundamentally unethical. I certainly understand Dr. Gergen's position, and I do agree on some of his points, most notably that zoos must be held to higher standards of animal treatment than they are currently. But my colleague fails to consider an important point in favor of zoos. The conservation of species is an incredibly important endeavor, and zoos are on the front line in the battle to save hundreds of species of animals around the world. Zoos often employ some of the leading experts in the field who are best equipped to carry out this important task. It is for this reason that I believe zoos are justified, though they may not be perfect, 
I believe zoos and the experts they employ play a critical role in the conservation of species and therefore are ethically permissible. Dr. Gergen, do you have a rebuttal to that point? Yes, certainly. While I appreciated Dr. Mester's position as a conservationist, and I do appreciate the work she and others like her do for animal welfare around the world, I must disagree with her. While zoos certainly do play a role in animal conservation, it is not because they are zoos that they play this role. Dr. Gergen, can you clarify that point for the audience? Of course. What I mean is this. It is not inherent in the idea of a zoo that they conserve animals. The notions are separable. You can have an animal conservation effort that is not a zoo, just as you can have a zoo that has nothing to do with conservation. So while it is true that some zoos act as animal preserves, this does not justify the existence of zoos, since we could easily separate out these animal preserves from zoos themselves. Fair point, but such animal preserves would still have the associated problems of poor treatment and unsuitable living conditions. Yes, but at least it would be in an effort towards a positive end. The animals would not be captive forever, and they would not be captive merely for a human audience. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 27 to 30. What about the enjoyment and education that zoos provide, especially to young people? Perhaps individuals like yourselves were inspired to become animal advocates by attending a zoo when you were a child. That is a really interesting point. I was indeed inspired by going to a zoo when I was a child. What do you think, Dr. Gergen? It is an interesting thought. What if the positive outcomes caused by inspiring people like us to do good in the future outweigh the harms done to zoo animals? I'm not sure I would have to think about it more, but it's certainly an interesting question. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. In closing, I'm not sure how much progress we've made, but is it safe to say that we can all agree that zoos, at the very least, must do their best to improve the treatment of animals and the conditions in which the animals live? I would certainly agree with that, as I'm sure my friends would also agree. That is the end of session three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, so now you have that half minute to check your answers, and you should use that half minute to check your answers uh, and not look at the next section. And now we will go through these questions together, students, and get the right answers. Here we go. All right, um, so the first couple were fairly easy. Uh, let's see uh, who got these. Uh, so section one in the listening is easier than section two. Section three is more difficult. Section four is the most difficult. Uh, aside from that, the questions within each section tend to get more and more difficult as well. So the beginning, these first few questions are the easiest. Then the next ones get more and more difficult. So let's match the professor. Number one, Dr. Henry Gergen. Which university is Dr. Henry Gergen from? Yeah, the University of uh, Edinburgh. That's right. Yeah. So uh, number one is A, University of Edinburgh, which of course leaves only B uh, for Dr. Gloria Mesto. So A and B, they're basically matched up in the same line as where they are. Uh, and uh, if you had to guess, I mean, it's a good one. You have a 50-50 to get it right. But hopefully you heard that. It was very clear in the beginning. The uh, host of the show says, I welcome Dr. Henry Gergen from the University of Edinburgh. Right? So that was good. Okay. Let's keep going. 
Uh, which three of the following are arguments given against zoos? So Dr. Henry Gergen, who, by the way, has a New Zealand accent. I don't know if some of you realized, hey, wait a second, that guy sounds kind of different than uh, a lot of the IELTS speakers. That's because he's from New Zealand, that speaker. Uh, but you could have a New Zealand accent in IELTS. It is possible, okay? Australian accent is possible. Canadian accent is possible in the listening. So mostly it's British, but careful, you could hear different accents. So here you had to choose three. The order doesn't matter. So it's for boxes 22, 23, 24 on your answer sheet. Again, the order here would not matter. It just matters that you get them correctly. So Dr. Henry Gergen, which three points does he make for zoos not being the best place to keep animals? Okay, Usman says it's A, D, and F, meaning they're treated inhumanely, animals should not be in prison, and they are fundamentally wrong, okay? Uh, it looks like there's some agreement between the students, especially on D and A. Okay, this answer, if you pay careful attention, this answer was repeated twice in the audio. So uh, Henry Gergen starts with this and ends with this. So he says zoos are fundamentally wrong. Then he says a few more pieces of information, and then he says they're fundamentally wrong again. Uh, he says this one two ways as well. He says... Animals should not be imprisoned. What else does he say which tells us that D is probably a good choice? So this one, he said twice. This one, he said twice in different ways. What else did he say which uh, lets you realize that this was a correct answer? Anybody? Catch what Dr. Gergen said. He said they should not be imprisoned. He actually said that they should not be imprisoned. So he used a different verb form of prison. He said they should not be imprisoned. And he said something else. Anybody catch that? Hopefully some of you are thinking, well, yeah, remember he said that animals should be free to do what they want, right? So free, should be free, is the opposite of should not be in prison, right? So he said should be free. Okay, remember that you can paraphrase or say the same idea uh, with an antonym negative. So the opposite of stay is go, right? And if I put the word don't here, then it becomes equal. So stay, don't go. Animals should be free. Animals should not be in prison. Very, very similar. Okay, all right. Keep that in mind, okay? That's an important paraphrasing. And I believe the last one is A, animals are treated inhumanely. So let's stick with A, D, and F here. We'll look at the answer key at the end, but those surely look good. If you can get two out of three here, that's fantastic, okay? If you lose one mark, don't panic. That's okay. That's a tough question. Okay, here we go, uh, 25 to 27, right? No more than two words and or a number for each. In order to improve the condition for zoo animals, zoos must be held to, uh, what did they say there? Rekha, that's right, they have the right to freedom was mentioned on the previous one as well. Amar Wadi, you had the correct answer there as well, so it was good. So Jamesh is asking an interesting question. He says, is there a specific method to identify answers in a much better way, like marking keywords or something like that? Jamesh, no. The answer is a big N-O. No, there is not. It's because of paraphrasing, Jamesh, that you can't do it. IELTS is not a go game of go fish. Does, <laughs> does everybody know what the game of go fish is? What is go fish? Little children play it. Mukesh, thank you for that answer while I'm asking my question. Zoos must be held to high standards.
yep, high standards uh, of animal treatment. Okay, so you're right, Amar Wadi, that was good as well. All right. Uh, Onisim, thank you for answering my question. So Onisim says, uh, like guessing my cards, right? Go fish. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So you have a uh, blue fish, red fish, yellow fish, purple fish. And then I have to guess which card you have. If I guess correctly, then you give me that card. Uh, IELTS doesn't work that way. IELTS is a test of English. It's a valid, reliable test of English. So you can't do um, reading and listening by just matching keywords. It does not work that way because of paraphrasing, because of tools the examiners use. So you cannot get a high band score by trying to match words, Jamesh. So there is that tech that is not a technique to match keywords. Okay. Uh, there are other good techniques, Jamesh, which are connected to paraphrasing and critical thinking and visualization that are very effective. Okay. All right, uh, while zoos, um, oh, just a sec, I'll get you back on screen here. One moment. While we get to the next question here. All right, here we go. So, uh, while zoos do conserve animal life, Dr. Gergen argues that this function can also be performed by animal and I have a good answer there. Thank you, Pachu, uh, from Usman. Uh, Usman, the only danger is that you use the singular form, okay? Uh, animal preserves. It should be plural. Animal preserves, okay? Um Preservation is the wrong word form, Pachu, but otherwise you have the right idea. Uh, the S is important here. Uh, if it were singular, it would be an animal, sorry, here, it would be an animal preserve, okay? Then it would be performed by an animal preserve, but here it's plural, by animal preserves, okay? So the S is important there, all right? Okay, but uh, good for you for catching it. Animal preserves are when you have uh, a large area of land that is fenced off, that is protected. In Africa, many elephants, uh, rhinoceros, are kept on animal preserves where they're protected by armed guards. Okay, that's an animal preserve. Um, all right. Enjoyment and, so this one, uh, Rekha, Mandeep, that's right. Like I say, education can be guessed if you use good logic. If you think about uh, a person going to a zoo, you can visualize that they have fun at the zoo and they're learning at the zoo. So enjoyment and education make sense. Now again, watch the two words. Here you have to have two words for the correct answer. Here it's one word and one word, okay? All right, let's keep going. Number 28 and 30. Uh, according to Dr. Gergen, does the value of inspiring young people outweigh the negative aspects of zoos? So when a young child goes to a zoo, they fall in love with the animals and they say, I will protect these animals in the future, so they're inspired. Uh, does he think, yeah, that's more important than the bad parts of zoos, or nope, or he's not sure. Okay, good, so a lot of you said C. Yeah, he actually says that, I'm not sure. And then he strengthens that comment. Uh, hopefully some of you can he still hear him say this in your head. I'd have to think about that one. Okay, uh, again, you can check your transcripts at the back of the book for this if you're not clear. All right, but C was the correct answer. Okay, a couple more, 29 and 30. What is the interesting question, and that's connected to 28, whether zoos are ethical, 
whether the inspiration value of zoos outweigh their negative aspects, whether enjoyment and inspiration negate the importance of zoos. So uh, Dr. Gergen says that is an interesting question. The correct answer was B. That's right. Yeah. So he's not sure if the inspiration or motivation of zoos is uh, better or more valuable than the negative aspects. So that's the interesting question. Okay. So if you got 28 and you understood it clearly, you should get 29 as well. And then what do the guests agree on? So do they agree that zoo conditions need to be improved? Zoos are unethical. The inspiration value of zoos is unethical. Again, here, logic can help you, okay? Logic is your friend. What would you say if you had to think about zoos? Yeah, very good, okay? Everybody who's answering A, Amarwadi, Usman, Rekha, Simhadri, Subash, good, yeah. A, they both believe that, yeah, okay, I mean, we can always improve the conditions of zoos, right? Make bigger space for the animals, keep them cleaner, keep them uh, more fresh, uh, treat the animals as best as we can, and we can always work to improve on that. So A was the correct answer there, okay? Save your marks. We're going to do uh, listening section four here in just a moment. Before that, let me make a couple of important notes for you so that you remember this when you're practicing at home, okay? So here's some listening strategies. Now is a good time for you to ask me questions if you want. Okay, listening section strategies. A, questions and audio are paraphrased. Okay, if you need, if you need a score over band 5.5, you cannot just match keywords. Okay, instead, you have to understand. One, paraphrasing. To say the same idea in different ways, okay? Now, there are different um, techniques for paraphrasing. I showed you one that was antonym plus negative, okay? So that means that stay is the same as don't go, okay? So maybe in the audio, you will hear the person say stay, and then in the questions or in the multiple choice, you'll see uh, Jane does not want the classmate to go, okay? So you realize that stay and don't go, it's the paraphrasing, all right? Uh, what are other ways that the audio and questions can paraphrase each other? So one way is antonym negative. Of course, another way, the most simple way is synonyms. Synonyms would be like, uh, for example, big, the same as large. Okay, so if the uh, audio says it was a big dinosaur and your choice is a large dinosaur, then clearly large and big are the same, so that's correct, okay? So you could hear big in the audio, and in the questions you will see large or huge, and you know that that's going to be the right answer. Uh, what's another way to paraphrase? So uh, Pachu says, well, how about word order or sentence order? Yeah, Pachu, in fact, that would be grammar, all right, is the technique. So grammar is another way, absolutely. Um, he had the experience of visiting 
France. I'm just throwing some examples at you of grammar paraphrasing. Um, he has visited France. Okay. Uh, this sentence is the same as this present perfect sentence. He had the experience of visiting France. Uh, or, sorry, I'll write a little bit more simple. He experienced visiting France. Okay. He experienced visiting France. He has visited France. This is the same, just with different grammar. Okay. Uh, remember that one as well. Uh, Pachu says descriptive. Yeah, absolutely. Descriptive is another one. So description. And that is often in uh, section three and section four of IELTS listening, uh, where you have to listen to a description and figure out the exact choice. Okay. Uh, expressions is another one who's saying that's great. Yeah. So description would be it's a fruit, red, round, and delicious, often given to teachers. What is it? What is that fruit? Anybody? It is an apple. Okay, hopefully some of you realize that. Thank you, Mukesh, absolutely. And expressions can also be used for paraphrasing and the listening. So um, I came across an interesting book in the library. So came across here being the phrasal verb, I discovered. Or maybe the question will say, he discovered an interesting novel. Okay. So notice how discovered paraphrases came across. Um, interesting novel, novel paraphrases book. Okay. Uh, here I can paraphrase a little bit more by saying, curious novel. Now I can do some grammar paraphrasing as well. Okay. So here with this last example, I want to show you how fancy IELTS can get or an exam can get with the paraphrasing in listening or in reading. So same technique is used in reading, okay? Um, so here I'm using expression, grammar, and synonym paraphrasing. I came across an interesting book in the library. An unusual novel was discovered by the man at the library. Active voice, passive voice, phrasal verb, precise verb. Okay, interesting, unusual, contextual synonym, book, novel, contextual synonym. So the more types of paraphrasing that I'm combining, the more difficult it becomes to just search for keywords. Okay, um, so here, if you're looking for a keyword in the question from the audio, you will not find it because basically every single word is different. Not only is every single word different, but the grammar structure is different. So virtually impossible to just match it up. The further you are in the listening section, the more paraphrasing is being used. Okay, keep that in mind. So section one listening, keep this in mind. This is an important tip. Okay. Section one listening. you will hear the most repetition and key word match, okay, as one of our students asked, versus section four, you will likely not hear keyword match 
and we'll have the most complex paraphrasing, okay, as I just showed you with this last example. So if you're looking for band 7, 7.58, especially for those of you who are looking to get those uh, express visas uh, to the UK or Canada, you cannot try to just do a keyword match for listening and reading. You have to master paraphrasing. You have to master critical thinking. It's possible, and we teach that on our websites, uh, and that is the right way to get those high IELTS band scores quickly. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, students, so that's some info about paraphrasing. Be familiar with antonyms, synonyms, grammar, description, and expression. All very, very important, all right? Okay, students, let's go to section four. Uh, waste not, want not. We got a little bit of time here. I want to uh, do section four with you. So uh, section four, here we go. The loggerhead turtle. It's about the loggerhead turtle. Hopefully everybody has a picture of the turtle in their mind. Again, students, I'm playing the audio from the website uh, using my uh, microphone here and a speaker. At home, of course, it's going to be much better for you if you use the website. But if you can't hear right now, then uh, turn up your volume. Don't write your answers into the chat. We will go through the answers together. So don't write it into the chat. Just wait till the end. Write down your answers on paper. Okay, use a pencil and paper to write them down. All right, so again, this is CD4, track number four, because it's test number four, listening four. Here we go, three, two, one. Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a professor discussing the migration of loggerhead turtles. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. It's late April on the South Atlantic coast of North America, and one of the most remarkable journeys in all of nature is about to begin. The loggerhead turtle, whose natural habitat is the open ocean, has to seek dry land to lay its eggs. The sandy beaches of Florida provide a perfect nesting spot with soft sand that can be dug up by the persistent flippers of the female loggerhead. Over the course of the next three months, hundreds of thousands of eggs will be laid on such beaches. Many of these eggs will become the victim of predators, but many will survive to hatching, which occurs two months after being laid. Hatching marks the beginning of an incredible journey for the loggerhead turtle. Almost immediately upon hatching, the young turtles, known as hatchlings at this point, head for the open ocean. The ocean, while full of its own dangers and predators, provides a relative safe haven for the hatchlings away from many of the predators that live near the shoreline. These young turtles embark upon a journey that will take them upwards of 13,000 kilometers around the North Atlantic. Many animals make large and incredible journeys, but what makes the loggerhead turtle's migration so notable is the speed at which the animal moves. While many bird species make similar journeys, they move at velocities much faster than the loggerhead turtle. This slow moving beast travels at the remarkably sluggish pace of only three quarters of a kilometer per hour. This means it will take the turtle a minimum of 17,000 hours to complete its migratory journey not even taking into account stops for feeding and sleep. To put that number in perspective, 17,000 hours is approximately two years of non-stop swimming. That the loggerhead turtle makes this journey alone makes it all the more impressive. From birth to adolescence to adulthood, the loggerhead turtle is a solitary traveler. But how does it know where to go? Doesn't it need a parent to help it know the route? This is where the loggerhead becomes even more fascinating. Recent research tells us the loggerhead uses the magnetic field of the Earth to determine its migration route. Because the Earth's magnetic field differs in each location around the world, the loggerhead turtle can use it as a kind of innate roadmap 
illuminating the way to where they need to be. One example of this is the behaviour they exhibit when they encounter the particular magnetic field off the coast of Portugal. Instead of continuing north, towards the cold waters of northern Europe, they sense the magnetic field and turn around, instead heading for the warmer waters of northwestern Africa. And it is not just that the loggerhead turtle has a sort of innate compass. They are able to determine, with surprising precision, their latitude and longitude. They know exactly when to zig and zag to optimise their migratory pattern. Even with their incredible ability to know where they are and where they need to be, the survival rate of migratory loggerhead turtles is incredibly low. In fact, only about one in 4,000 hatchlings makes it back to the beach in eastern Florida to mate and lay its eggs. However, that any make it at all is an incredible achievement and one of the great natural wonders of navigation. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, students, so there you heard lots of different examples of paraphrasing. If you paid attention, there were synonyms, grammar paraphrasing, expressions being used, so the whole gambit of paraphrasing techniques. Very smooth, continuous movement of information, no pausing halfway, so you really have to uh, pay attention. For this type of flow chart, Section four question students, one of the most important points to keep in mind are uh, positions and where you're at. So usually they will give you key words like seek dry land in the beginning, just so you know that the answers are about to follow. Okay. So in this sense, you need to pay attention to certain words so that you know your position in the flow chart. All right. Okay, students, let's go through the answers together. So the sandy beaches of, yes, it has to be a location, and uh, Usman and Simhadri and uh, Onisim are saying it's Florida. So f the sandy beaches of Florida is the perfect location for nesting. Absolutely. So you have to write Florida in your answer sheet. Uh, Florida, you have to have a capital F, must be, it's the name of a state, so it has to be a big F. Mukesh, if you write it with a small F, or Dahari Atef, you will get it wrong, okay? You have to have a big F, it's the name. So be very careful in your official IELTS that when you get the right answer, don't lose it because of a small F, okay? Florida's a name, right? The other way, of course, is you could write it all big like this. Just careful with your spelling. Florida. Okay. All right. Uh, provide the perfect location for nesting. After hatching, the loggerhead turtle immediately heads for the ocean. The ocean is safer than the shore because it has fewer. Now they repeated this word a couple of times. So uh, Mandeep, that's correct. This is a common noun, so you don't need capitals. Predators have to have an S because of the word fewer. So no S, you will get it wrong. Okay, it has to have S. Predators has to be spelt correctly. No need to apologize, Mukesh. That's fine. Just keep it in mind. All right. So fewer predators. Good. Uh, the turtles embark on a journey that will take them something kilometers around the Atlantic. So clearly this is a number. Uh, how many kilometers? Yeah, 13,000 seems right. Uh, you can do it both ways. So Nair used 13,000. That's okay. Mukesh says 13,000. Uh, yeah, 13,000 around the uh, uh, Atlantic. Again, uh, Amar and uh, Onisim use a little bit of logic, and you'll realize that 30. And 70 is unlikely because the entire circumference of planet Earth is, anybody? How big is the world around? How many kilometers around the equator? So if I start in Ecuador and start running around planet Earth directly along the equator, how long or will I be running? So how, what's the distance of the Earth around its equator? 
Okay, there's, that would help you to realize that it has to be 13,000 for the answer and not more. The Earth, I wonder if somebody's looking it up on Google right now. How, how long is the equator? Um, no, Onisim, it's not that long. It's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 24,000 something. Okay, 24,600 would be my guess. It's 24,000 something, if I'm not mistaken. So the Earth is 24,000 few hundred kilometers around. So uh, it can't be 30 or it can't be 70 because that means that the turtle is going around and around the planet. That doesn't make sense, okay? So roughly about half, a little bit more than half the distance around the planet, okay? But obviously it's just the Atlantic Ocean, not the Pacific Ocean here. Okay, uh, while long migratory journeys are fairly commonplace in nature, what makes the loggerhead's journey especially notable is the extremely what? Fast? I don't think so, Mukesh. It's a turtle. Turtles are not known to be fast. Okay. Uh, Onisim says low speed. It can't be speed because pace is speed. So pace equals speed. So you don't need that word. What's the opposite of fast? Slow, right? It's a turtle, ladies and gents. Turtles don't move that fast. Slow, or if you caught the exact word, it's sluggish. Okay? Both of those would be good. Slow or sluggish. Turtles move slowly. It's a turtle. Okay? Sluggish. Slow. The entire journey is equal to approximately something of continuous swimming with no breaks. So how long? I remember the, the person said approximately uh, 17,000 hours, but that was also given as approximately two years, right? Yeah. So... Two years of continuous swimming with no breaks. They will take this answer, two and years abbreviated, okay? So approximately two years, not 17,000 hours. Two years is the correct answer there, okay? Has to be plural. Again, years because it's two, right? Okay, let's keep going. So if you got the two years, good for you. Got sluggish or slow. Again, remember logic. It's very important. As incredible as the loggerheads, loggerhead turtle's journey is, what makes it even more impressive is that the loggerhead is a something traveler. Onisim says solitaire. It's solitary, Onisim. So you're very close. Solitary, or for example, another way to say it is a solo traveler, meaning that it travels alone, okay? You can't use alone because alone is an adverb of manner. It doesn't fit grammatically, but solo or solitary are the adjectives for alone, okay? So these are the adjective forms. So a solo traveler or a solitary uh, traveler. Absolutely. Uh, some of you maybe saw uh, Finding Nemo, uh, that Disney, uh, Pixar, no, it's Disney uh, animation movie with the clownfish, and you see all those loggerhead turtles swimming together. Uh, that's usually not the way it is uh, for these turtles. They're swimming alone, solo, by themselves. Okay. So solitary traveler. Traversing the open ocean on its own for years at a time, scientific research has in recent years told us that it is through a connection with the Earth's what? What is number 37? Very good, Mandeep. Very good, Onisim. Very good, Sevgi. Magnetic field. Two words. Very good. Make sure the spelling is correct. That the turtles find their way around the ocean. For example, the turtles are able to sense something off the coast of. Coast is the shoreline or the beach line of 
a location. So here it would have to be uh, some name of a country or a state. I'm just going to get you a little bit more. There you go. It's a bit better. And for all of those answering Portugal, Ali, Amar, Onisim, Sevgi, you're doing right. So off the coast of Portugal, that's right, that it makes them change their direction and head for Northwest Africa. Possessing more than a simple compass, the loggerhead can innately sense it's something and longitude. So longitude and... Longitude are the lines that go around. So if you're looking at planet Earth, there's lines that we use to divide planet Earth this way. Those are the longitude lines. And these lines that go horizontally are called, that's right, latitude. Okay, it's latitude, longitude. Know those words in English. Could save your life if you're lost in the forest. Okay, latitude. So latitude longitude all right that gives you your position so if you ever use a gps or if you're lost that's hopefully what you can learn to discover is your lo uh, latitude longitude those are your coordinates and then you know where you are all right last question multiple choice you had to do a little bit of math approximately what percentage of these little baby turtles these hatchlings make it back to the breeding ground in florida a, 0.025%, B, 2.5%, or C, 25%. Onisim, Nair, Ali, Dahari, and Mandeep are all in agreement that it's A, it's 0.025%. Yes, because the speaker says one in 4,000 of these hatchlings make it back to Florida, approximately. So 1 in 4,000 equals 0.025%. All right. Fantastic, students. Good for you. Okay. Way to hang in there. Uh, again, another quick important strategy to keep in mind for those of you looking for a band score 6.5 or higher is use your logic. Okay. So this is B. Keep in mind that approximately 40% of questions in the listening and reading, by the way, can be figured out using logical deduction. Okay? Practice that at home. Let's look at the answer keys here students and count up your marks so answer keys are on page 136 uh okay so i know many of you have your uh marks from uh last week's class so you'll add those together here you can see that the answers for question 21 it's a Number two is B, so that's how you would mark it in your answer sheet, okay? So 1A, comma, 2B, okay? Count up your marks. And then here we have A, B, and F. I said D, but it was B, A, B, and F, any order. 25 higher standards. High standards, I think, is okay. 26 preserves. 27, education, 28, C, 29, B, 30, A, 31, Florida, 32, predators, 33 is the number 13,000, 34, slow or sluggish, two years for 35, solitary for 36, 37, magnetic field, 38, Portugal, 39, latitude, and 40, is a all right students add up your uh, score your raw score so from 40 that's called your raw score in the listening section 
And then I can tell you your estimated band score. Uh, when we go back here to the website, I have to make it a bit darker because it's a bright background, so just bear with me. Uh, at the bottom of our website, both at GLshelp and AEHelp.com, you have this, uh, I'm going to make it huge, uh, you have this score calculator at the bottom, okay? So if we click on that score calculator, then uh, we can enter in our raw score. The first one here is the listening, the second is the reading. So there's our raw score. So uh, Rekha says you got 30. Okay, Rekha, that's pretty good. 30 out of 40 is a band score seven. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Uh, Pachu says 28. 28 is 6.5. Okay, it's not bad, Pachu. It's a pretty good job. All right. Usman, you got 13 out of 20 just for section three and four. It's not bad. Usman, 13 out of 20 for section three and four is pretty good. Okay. Onisim says 35. 35 is a band eight, Onisim. So that's very good. Dahari, 30 is a band seven. Okay, students, so don't forget you can go there. When you do your practice exams, just go to our uh, website, click the score calculator. You can put it in there, and then it will tell your score, so you don't have to keep in mind the differences in the band scores. And this is for general IELTS. The reading will be different. Okay, so keep that in mind. For academic IELTS, go to aehelp.com because the band scores work differently uh, from academic in general. In an academic, the higher band scores are closer together. Okay, and again, students, don't forget that if you really want to get the highest score on your next IELTS exam and you don't want to pay for that expensive IELTS exam again and again, then it's absolutely a good idea to visit our website and click that big red button and join our full course, okay? So join that full course, do yourself a favor. If you're doing academic IELTS, go to this one with the blue background and click that big red button. Okay, students, so tomorrow we are doing general IELTS reading in our live class. Make sure you tune in for that. Same time, 13.30 to 14.30 uh, Central European time. You're very welcome, Mukesh. I hope everybody uh, learned some valuable information. Rekha, you're absolutely welcome. In 30 minutes, I will be doing a reading lesson on our Academic English Help YouTube channel for Academic IELTS. Have an awesome rest of your day, everyone. Make sure to practice these strategies at home. Make sure to practice paraphrasing regularly. It is the most magical strategy that you can learn to improve your IELTS scores. Paraphrasing, paraphrase, paraphrase every day. Bye for now, everyone. See you soon.